All right, as we continue our study of the life of Christ, this is our third quarter in this study, and it will be our last quarter. Uh, if you weren't aware, tonight does mark the beginning of a new quarter of classes. There are some new offerings, and I'm not trying to discourage you from being here. I'm just letting you know there are some uh, brochures on the table in the lobby that uh, outline the different classes we're offering. Just want you to be aware of that. But this is our third consecutive quarter on the life of Christ, and we're going to conclude our study of his life during this quarter. In fact, the bulk of this quarter is going to be spent on the, the last days of Jesus' life. We'll be transitioning into the last week here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and tonight we're going to kind of be setting up for that by studying a, a significant event toward the end of Jesus' Jesus's ministerial career, and that is the raising of Lazarus. So I encourage you to turn over to John chapter 11 with me. John chapter 11 is the only recording of this particular miracle. We will have a long reading tonight. Uh, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 44 as we uh, prepare to talk about this significant event in the ministry of Jesus, the raising of Lazarus. So John chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said, to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, Know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave. And a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, 
by, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you would always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. That's the story of Lazarus' resurrection. And I want to take a moment just to walk through the details and make some observations as we get started with our study tonight. The first significant detail being that Lazarus lived in Bethany. Now, for us, that doesn't signify a whole lot, but there is one statement made about Bethany down in, in, in verse 18, that Bethany was about two miles outside of Jerusalem. So Bethany is a suburb of Jerusalem. It's actually less than two miles, but that is a rounding of the distance. It's on the, Bethany's located on the east side of Jerusalem, on the main highway that travels from Jerusalem to Jericho. Yes, the very, very highway that Jesus alludes to in the parable of the Good Samaritan, if you will. And so Bethany is in this significant route outside of Jerusalem. It's on the route that a, a Jewish person might take if they were traveling from, from Jerusalem to Galilee, because they would travel east to Jericho, cross the Jordan River, then travel up the eastern side of the Jordan River to avoid going through Samaria. So Bethany is in, a, in an important location. Here is a, a, a Google Earth map showing on the left side of the screen the temple in Jerusalem, marked by the red star with the word temple, and then on the right side of the screen you can see the, the marking for Bethany. That is not a, 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 a la large distance between Bethany and the major center of Jerusalem. Very close to each other. In fact, yeah, let's see here. Right here, there's a little blue dot right about there. That's the Garden of Gethsemane. So you can get a, an idea of just the proximity of where uh, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived and, and where these significant events in the life of Jesus are about to unfold at the end of his life. So we have this real close proximity when Jesus goes to Bethany to, to, uh, to where Lazarus lived and where he was buried. So it's worth pointing out this location. The, that's the first detail worth mentioning, that Lazarus lived in Bethany. It's also important to note here the reference to Mary and Martha, that, that Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha. See, in, in, this, in the Gospels, we've been introduced to Mary and Martha already. We have not been introduced to Lazarus. We haven't talked about them in this class, but if you journey through, uh, through the Gospels, Mary and Martha get mentioned in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through um, 42. It's an occasion where Jesus is in the region of Bethany and he is welcomed into the home of Mary and Martha. You might be familiar with the story because Martha gets busy with all the hostess duties. Mary spends all of her time sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his teaching. Martha gets upset with Mary because she's not helping. And then Martha takes the problem to Jesus and says, in effect, hey, would you tell your, my sister to help me? And Jesus says she's chosen, that Mary has chosen the better thing. Um, so that we, we, we've already been introduced to them with that story. It's also interesting, in John's gospel here in chapter 11, he, uh, he makes mention of, of Mary and says, hey, this is the one who anointed the feet of Jesus. This is the one who, who, uh, wet his, uh, uh, who, who uh, wiped up his, his feet with her hair and all that. What's interesting is that story has not happened in John's gospel yet. John references a story he hasn't even told yet because the anointing of Jesus' feet by Mary happens in John chapter 12. This is John chapter 11. So it's interesting. John presupposes that his readers have already heard about Mary and Martha to some degree, particularly about the story of Mary anointing Jesus' feet. Now, in the other gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that story 
of the anointing of, of, of uh, Jesus' feet by Mary uh, is told, um, in some cases, it has already been told. If you've read those gospel accounts before you get to John's, it's already been told. Uh, I think, I think uh, some of them leave her, her name out of the story, but the event itself is relayed. So it is, is fascinating that, that, uh, that John makes reference to an event he has yet to tell. But it does give us the indication that John expects us to already know who Mary and Martha are. As the, as the author of this text, he expects his readers to already be familiar with them. Uh, and m- more so than with La- Lazarus only gets mentioned in John chapter 11 and John chapter 12. Now you may think about um, the, the parable Jesus told of, of Lazarus and the rich man. We're not dealing with the same individual it's just a, 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 a person in that story that is also named Lazarus. It's not this Lazarus, though. But, but the Lazarus, who is the sibling of Mary and Martha, only gets mentioned in John chapter 11 and verse, in, in chapter 12. In chapter 12, Lazarus will be a dinner guest with Jesus at, at a, um, Simon's house, not Simon the apostle, but, but Simon the, the Pharisee, where Mary will then anoint Jesus' feet. So uh, La- Lazarus does not get spoken of a lot, but he does play a significant, significant role here in a couple of events uh, toward the end of Jesus' ministerial career. Another detail we need to emphasize here is that Jesus loved Lazarus. We're specifically told, John chapter 11 and verse 3, the message Mary and Martha send to Jesus, he whom you love is ill. And then John specifically tells us in ch- uh, chapter 11, verse 5, that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now, it's easy for us to go, well, Jesus loved everyone. But the language here is, is conveying to us that there is some degree of intimacy, some special relationship that exists between Jesus and this family. It, it's trying to drive home the point that these, this family, these individuals, are really special to Jesus. Now you think about the miracles Jesus has performed. Many of them have been for strangers. Some of them have been for people he's closely connected with. I think about how he heals Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, he may have stayed in the house of Peter. He may, may have spent time in that house where that particular woman was a hostess to him. So he has connections, but this one for Jesus, this is hitting really close to home. This is someone he deeply loves, not just in the general sense, but in the specialized sense. In fact, in John chapter 11, verse 36, after Jesus wept, those who witnessed his tears said, see how he loved him. See how Jesus loved Lazarus? He's crying over it. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But the point is that Lazarus and Jesus possessed an intimate relationship that was acknowledged by Jesus' peers. Uh, Jesus, in verse 11 of this chapter, would even refer to Lazarus as our friend. His friend personally and a friend of the disciples. So there is, a, there is an intimacy here that, that really impacts the story and is worth pointing out. Next thing we need to know is that Jesus was informed that Lazarus was sick. Jesus is not in Bethany at this time. If John's chronology uh, is, is accurate at this point, the last place Jesus was is in the location where John was baptizing. We know that because if you back up to the end of chapter 10 uh, of John, you'll see that that's where Jesus was located. Let me uh, pull that up for just a second and, and show that to you. John chapter 10, at the very end of the chapter, you get to verse 40. We're told that Jesus went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. That's the last known location in John's gospel prior to Jesus going to Bethany. And so the, the, the likelihood is we're talking about a location on the eastern side of the Jordan River um, near the Dead Sea, probably parallel to Jericho in some fashion. But even the travel from where Jesus is would be located in that region to Bethany would likely have been a day's journey because it would have been all uphill. 
Jerusalem set on a, a, a mountain ridge. Bethany as a suburb of it is also elevated much more. I mean, you know the Dead Sea is below sea level. And Jesus would have been kind of in that valley-like area. And so it would have been a, a day's journey more than likely for him to get to where, to get from where he is to where Lazarus is. And it's in this vicinity that Jesus is informed that Lazarus was sick. And if you look at the text, if you look at what's said to him, it, from our vantage point, it's a very ambiguous, vague statement. Verse 3, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now, I'm such a logical person that I don't always perceive um, underlying messages and things that are said to me, especially if they're if they are not said in person where I have body language and tone and, and, and I can read some extra symbols. My wife can attest to my inability to sometimes read the undercurrent of what's actually being said. And I'm sure some of you men have the same problem occasionally. So when I read that, you know, I, I, to me, somebody came and stated a fact to Jesus. They just came and told him, Lazarus is ill. It's, it reminds me of when Jesus' mom is, and him are at that wedding, and his mom comes to him and says, hey, they have no wine. All right, okay, you just stated a fact for me. Great. Okay, I'm, I, I now know a situation. But implicit in this statement, implicit in, in what's being communicated to Jesus here, is an expectation that he would do something about it. Implicit is a request. Hey, the one you love is ill. We don't have the words that say, come help, or can you do something, or, or you need to get here now. We don't have it said because it's implied in the statement. And, and so we, we shouldn't read this as simply, hey, a servant showed up to tell Jesus Lazarus was ill, and that's all that was said, and that's done. No, the, the statement has an implicit request for Jesus to come do something about it. They would not have sent a messenger to find Jesus to tell him this information if it wasn't because they wanted, if it was not for the fact that they wanted Jesus to come address it. In fact, what's the first thing both Mary and Martha say when Jesus arrives on the scene? Lord, if you had been here, you could have done something about it. There's an implicit re request for him to come help because they know he can heal. Jesus' healing ministry at this point in his career is so evident, so well-known, so historic, if you will, that they know if Jesus gets here, if Jesus is here, he can heal whatever it is that Lazarus has. We're never told what made Lazarus sick. But they knew Jesus could heal it, whatever it was. But here's where the story gets interesting. Because Jesus intentionally delayed going to Lazarus. You know, and it's very easy for us to look at this text and ponder Jesus' decision. Someone Jesus loves is sick. Jesus has the power to cure that illness. And Je Jesus deliberately does not go. It's easy for us to analyze it and go, well, man, this seems very inconsiderate. This seems to lack compassion. This, this seems to be almost rude. It's very easy for us in our human, uh, more mortal interpretation of things to see this delay a a almost as a cruelty. I want you to imagine for a moment you're the servant that had to go deliver the message to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, the one you love, Lazarus, he's ill. And now you got to go back. And you got to tell Mary and Martha. And when you get back to Bethany, guess what? Mary and Martha are going to be like, hey, did you find Jesus? Yeah, I found Jesus. Did you tell him Lazarus is sick? Yeah, I told him Lazarus is sick. So where is he? I don't know. I, did, did he not come? Did he not follow you? I, I don't know. I mean, how would you like to be the servant having to go back and, 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 and explain 
that Jesus didn't come. Can you imagine when Mary and Martha got that news from the servant? What's going through their minds? You mean to tell me Jesus, Jesus didn't come? Even though he knew that it was Lazarus. I mean, you did tell him it was Lazarus, right? He knew it was Lazarus that's sick, and he didn't come? And so it's, it's important to notice here that Jesus' delay is not out of ignorance. It's very clear to Jesus. He knows the situation. He knows Lazarus is ill. And it's important to notice that Jesus' delay is not out of um, a lack of affection. Because if you look at John chapter 11, verse 5, after he's been informed of Lazarus' illness, John makes it very clear that Jesus loves Lazarus. We're not told that Jesus, or, or we're told that Jesus loves Mary, Martha, and Lazarus after Jesus has received the news. I think that's John's way of saying, hey, I want you to understand this isn't cruelty on Jesus' part. Jesus loved them. Jesus has a deep affection for them. There is a greater reason for his decision. And that's where we need to look. We need to understand that there are some stated reasons here for why Jesus delayed. If you look at John chapter 11 and verse 4, Jesus indicated that Lazarus' illness would serve for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. There's purpose. And it's interesting because that statement that, this, that Lazarus' illness was for the glory of God it can have a double meaning here to some degree. One sense is that the death of Lazarus was not to be the end of the story, but the glory of God would be evidenced in that Jesus was about to bring him back from the dead. So in, in that sense, the statement parallels something Jesus said to his disciples before he the blind man in uh, John chapter 9, which is a story we did, we did not cover in, in this series. But Jesus saw, saw the healing, the miracles, as a means of bringing glory to God. But there is another instance in which Lazarus' illness slash death brings glory to God. And that is that it becomes the event that would inevitably lead to uh, the religious leader's plot on Jesus' life. Lazarus' resurrection is going to be the spark the, the last major spark, I should say, for the religious leaders to pursue Jesus' death. And it's going to be through Jesus' death and resurrection that God gets the ultimate glory. So there is a, an immediate application of what Jesus is saying in reference to the glory of God, and there is a long-term application, all filtering through the events of Lazarus here. So one reason Jesus said he is delayed, he's, he delayed, one reason he's not going immediately is because there is this, this glory of God that's going to be manifested and glory of himself that's going to be manifested through this event. But I think it's also important to notice what Jesus said in verse 15 of John 11 because he indicated that he was glad that he was not there when Lazarus was sick. And the reason he was glad that he was not there is so that you, the disciples, so that the disciples may believe. He knew that what he was going to do with Lazarus was going to be a faith-confirming event like nothing else. So Jesus can see the bigger picture, the grander purpose, the, 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 um, the greater benefit that no one else can see. And Jesus is going to follow his Father's lead here. It's moments like this in the life of Jesus. Moments where he can set aside the human emotion, the love he has for Lazarus, because I guarantee Jesus wanted to go heal Lazarus. But Jesus had to control himself to stay 
in the confines of his father's will. When he's praying in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will but yours be done, that's not the first time he ever prayed that. I'm certain of it because his whole life is built around the idea that I'm going to surrender to my father's will in all manner. In every event, in every timetable, in everything that I have to do, I'm surrendering to his will. And Jesus is the only one here that understands that God has a greater will for what's going to happen with Lazarus. And he's surrendering to that. And here's the thing. A couple of observations about Lazarus here, or, or about the timetable of, the, of Jesus delaying and it being four days and that sort of thing. We're told a little bit later that uh, when Jesus is at the, to the graveside, that it, Lazarus had been dead four days. Here's the thing. It's quite possible that Lazarus was dead by the time Jesus received the message. I mean, by the time Jesus reached the tomb, the text says that Lazarus had been dead for four days. Given the two-day delay and the time for travel, both of the messenger coming to Jesus and of Jesus leaving where he is and going to Lazarus, it's not impossible that Lazarus could have died while the messenger was en route to Jesus. So it's quite possible that his delay would not have mattered in sustaining Lazarus from the grave. That Lazarus would have died before he got there anyway. But it's also important to note that by waiting to leave until Lazarus is dead, particularly dead for as long as he was, that Jesus is demonstrating himself be the resurrection and the life. Here's why. The general belief of Jews in that time period was that the spirit of the deceased hovered around the body for three days in anticipation of some possible means of reentry to the body, according to one scholar. But on the third day, it was believed that the body lost its color and the spirit was locked out. Therefore, the spirit was obliged to enter the shield. And so in some elements of Jewish thought, the passing of the third day signaled the conclusion of the last medium for a spirit to return to the body. What that means is that by, del- by making sure he wasn't there until four days into this death, nobody could claim it was a resuscitation. Nobody could claim that there was some other avenue through which life was restored to Lazarus. Jesus' delay made this resurrection irrefutable. And that's going to be significant. We'll get to that in just a moment. Because not only does Jesus intentionally delay going to Lazarus, but we need to also notice that his disciples opposed the trip to Bethany. They were against going to Bethany. They're against it because they feared for Jesus' life. We've already seen on the screen how close Bethany is to Jerusalem. Less than two miles, John 11 verse 18 says. And the Jews in Jerusalem, particularly the the leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all these, uh, the chief priests, they had recently attempted to stone Jesus. Just go back in John chapter 10, verses 22 through 39 of John chapter 10. The crowds attempted to stone him during the Feast of Dedication while he was walking in the area of the temple called Solomon's Colonnade. Jesus, in this episode, had made the statement, I and the Father are one. The Jews took that as blasphemy. And, and in the chapter prior to Lazarus' resurrection, G, there was an attempt on Jesus' life that he, is, he evaded. His disciples are aware of this. They're like, listen, these, the disciples are sitting here thinking, the people in Jerusalem have not forgotten this yet. You step foot close to there, they're going to pick up stones again. His disciples are afraid for his life because 
it was so recently threatened. And it wasn't the only time it was threatened. You go, go back to John chapter 8 on an occasion where Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Guess what? They tried to stone him in John chapter 8. So his disciples are afraid for him. But Jesus is not afraid. Jesus has been telling them this is going to happen. He's been telling them he has to go to Jerusalem and, and he, he has to die. And there is this, this interesting little snippet of conversation involving Thomas. We know Thomas basically for one thing. And what is that? Doubt. But Thomas, who really only appears in John's gospel, there's more to him than just the doubt that appears after the resurrection. In this moment, after hearing uh, Jesus plainly tell them that Lazarus was dead in order to get them to understand why, why he had to go to Bethany, Thomas said in verse 16, Let us also go that we may die with him. We often think of Peter as being the guy who says things that, that, that he shouldn't have said, says things without thinking. Thomas is kind of doing that too. But here's the thing about Thomas. In this moment, Thomas is what one commentator called a realist. You know what a realist is? A pessimist who doesn't want to be called a pessimist. And here's what Thomas is doing. He's resigned to the fact that if they go to Jerusalem, they're dying. He's accepted worst case scenario outcome, and he believes that's the only option if they make this trip. But don't be down on Thomas. Because just like Peter and the walking on the water thing, there's a mistake Peter makes when he loses focus, but there's something beautiful about the fact that he got out of the boat in the first place. Here, Thomas says something that is very, uh, um, oh, what, I cannot think of the word. Uh, Thomas says something that, that is very disparaging. But he does it with an element of courage as well. He is prepared to die with Jesus. He's willing to go there. So, we can be so hard on Thomas sometimes. But in this moment, his realism is paired with courage. And what he says, let us also go that we, we may die with him. Shouldn't that be the de declaration of every disciple? Shouldn't we all be ready and willing to die for the one who died for us. So we need to at least recognize that about Thomas here. So his disciples don't want him to go, but, but after Jesus explains the situation and, and what's happening and, and that, he's, that, that uh, Lazarus is dead and he's, he's, going to, he's going there so that God can be glorified and so that, they're, so that they can believe consent. They, not that Jesus needed them to, but they, they say, okay, we're going. And by the time they get there, Lazarus was buried. He was already in the tomb, as we've acknowledged many times before. Uh, just a couple of things to know. The, the Jews didn't bury in the ground like we do. They buried in caves. They had a, they'd hew out um, a, a tomb in the side of a cliff or, or a uh, in some rock, and, and they would bury in caves. And they would typically bury in family caves. You would have more than one person in, in a cave. Uh, the, the cave could be vertical or it could be horizontal. And then it was, as we know in the case of Jesus, it would normally be sealed by a stone. Um, one of the things to know about Jewish burial is it typically happened the same day of death. Because decomposition happened very quickly in Palestine um, just due to the elements, due to the climate. And they were not the expert embalmers that the Egyptians were. Spices as such were applied to Jesus' body, spices and oils, 
were typically used just to hide the smell of death. And so in this culture, your burial typically happened as soon as possible after death. If you could get it in that day, you did. Think about Jesus. He was in the tomb on the same day that he died. The, cor- the, the corpse was customarily laid out on a sheet of linen, wide enough to envelop the whole body, and more than twice the length of the corpse, typically. And the, bo- the body was so placed on the sheet that the feet were at one end, and then the sheet were drawn over the head and back down to the feet, that sort of thing. The feet were bound at the ankles, and the arms were tied to the body with linen strips, and the face was bound with another cloth. A person so bound could hop and shuffle, but they couldn't really walk. Which helps us understand why Jesus' first instruction when Lazarus emerges is to unbind him. And one thing to notice is that when Jesus arrives, John 11 verse 19 tells us that many Jews were present. And that seems to suggest that Lazarus had, was some person of influence, possibly. But the real reason we're told that there were many there is because that means there were a lot of people to witness what's about to happen. Witnessing this event becomes the centerpiece of the story, as we'll talk about in just a moment. When Jesus arrives, Martha runs out to meet him. We noted that in verse 21. Martha says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would, have, would not have died. When Mary goes out to meet Jesus, John chapter 11, verse 32, she says the same thing. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Both of them believe that Jesus could have healed Lazarus if he had arrived before Lazarus died, but they seem to not believe Jesus can do anything after the point of death. There is this one statement that Martha makes in verse 22. After saying, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died, she said, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I'm not sure that she's declaring that, hey, you can, you can bring him back to life. I'm not sure that that's what she's referencing, because if you remember, they get to the tomb, and Martha's the one who says, well, Lord, it's been four days, he's going to smell bad. When she says that, that's, that's not indicating any level of faith that Jesus can bring Lazarus back to life. So I'm not sure that here in verse 22 she's proclaiming a, a belief that Jesus can bring Lazarus back. I think it's more she's confessing her belief of the intimacy between the Father and the Son. That she's acknowledging that God listens to him and she's conveying her faith in Jesus. Because if you follow along in the conversation, Jesus will say, your, your, your brother will rise again. Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Not, oh, I know you can do that right now. And if you follow the conversation even further, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then asks, do you believe this? And Martha says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. Everything she's saying is professing the right doctrinal beliefs, professing the right faith. She is, in all ways, shapes, and form, correct in her declarations. But she doesn't fully seem to believe that Jesus can do something about the situation right now. She's got the right theology but she still seems to lack faith in the greater application. Truth is, that sounds a lot like us, doesn't it? We can say all the right things, have all the right answers, quote all the right scriptures. But sometimes we still fail to walk by faith and not by sight. The one feature of the story that we we do need to address very quickly is the detail that stands out to us the most. It's the one recorded in verse 35, that Jesus wept. One thing that's interesting to me as I, I studied this account is actually a phrase that's used in verse 33 and verse 38. 
If you look at verse 33, we're told that when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved. That's the ESV. Does your translation say something different than deeply moved? Grieved in spirit. Was that uh, New King James? King James? New American Standard? New King James? I think King James says the same thing. What was that? And, and troubled. I didn't include the troubled part. Now, when we hear that, deeply moved, grieved in spirit, we automatically think, oh, he's mourning. Same language of being deeply moved or grieved in spirit appears in verse 38. This is what I found interesting as I was studying this is that in both of these passages, the Greek word that's translated deeply moved or, or grieved is found elsewhere in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 9, verse 30, Mark chapter 1, verse 43, and Mark chapter 14, verse 5. In Matthew chapter 9, and verse 30, it is translated sternly warned. In Mark chapter 1, verse 43, it's translated sternly charged. And in Mark chapter 14, verse 5, it is translated scolded. Very interesting translations in those passages as opposed to this one. I'm not saying the word can't have multiple meanings, but it is interesting. Because in Matthew and Mark, the meaning of this term has to do with rebuking or giving a stern warning. It has led some scholars to suggest that the reaction of Jesus to the wailing of the mourners was not empathetic support, but was actually disgust leading to anger. That was interesting to me to come across. What could possibly make Jesus angry in this moment? There are two possibilities. Some think that Jesus is moved by their grief and is consequently angry with the sin, sickness, and death in this fallen world that, that wrecks life so much, that brings so much havoc and generates so much sorrow. That Jesus here is angered by the presence of sin that has corrupted this world that God created to be perfect. Others think that the anger is directed at the unbelief itself that's present, that the men and the women before him were grieving like pagans, like the, the rest of men who have no hope, as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 says. Maybe it's even anger at Mary and Martha for, for their lack of faith in the moment. He ha he has specifically said to Martha, your brother will rise again, and she's not getting it. She's not, he says, I am the resurrection and the life, and she's not getting it. So those are, some, those are possible suggestions as to why it might be a case of G Jesus being angry. You know, there's only one other time in the Gospels that we're told that Jesus shed tears. That's in Luke chapter 19 and verse 41. He wept over Jerusalem and its impending judgment in that context. And it's interesting because the terminology used in, in Luke chapter 19 and verse 41 about Jerusalem is not the same terminology used in John eleven thirty five. 35. In fact, he, the, the word used for weeping in reference to Mary, Martha, and, and the others present is not the same word used for Jesus weeping. John used the creo for Jesus weeping. He used klaeo in reference to Mary and the mourners in verse 34. Verse 35 uses a different term for weep than verse 34. I don't know if that's significant, but it just caught my attention. I, I get the impression that Jesus, Jesus is dealing with more emotions here than just sorrow. That there may be more going on inside him at this moment than just, hey, my loved one is dead. That, that maybe there's a pain inside him at the situation he's seeing. Maybe there's a pain inside him knowing that in order for him to permanently conquer the death that has taken his beloved friend, it's going to require his life. Just maybe this Jesus wept is bigger than we recognize sometimes. That there's more pain involved than meets our eyes. So what I want to do with our remaining five minutes 
is I want to make a couple of observations about this, the, the importance, the significance of this miracle. I think the first thing that's worth, uh, worth noting is that this miracle demonstrated Jesus' focus on the bigger picture. I mentioned this earlier. Jesus recognized that there was something more important than getting to Bethany to heal his friend. That there was a bigger thing at play. And it's Jesus' very uh, ability to recognize that and surrender to it that, that, that made it possible for him to go to the cross. When Jesus went to Calvary, he went there seeing the bigger picture of what it does for mankind and how it, it addresses the sin issue that we could not address for ourselves. Jesus died because he could see the bigger picture of salvation that you and I sometimes fail to see. I think this miracle is also significant because it highlighted Jesus' humanity. We just talked about the fact that he wept, and I mentioned maybe there's more to the weeping. Maybe there is an element of, 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 of anger involved as well. Maybe it's a mix of emotions. It doesn't matter. Here's what stands out. In this story, we have a, a glimpse into the human side of Jesus and, and how things pained him and how things affected him and how he had emotions. One thing I love to do that, that I, I, I do not do in this setting, but sometimes when I've done classes on Jesus' life, I like to utilize some of our movies that depict Jesus' life and do some comparisons uh, of the different tellings of his life. One of the most popular movies of Jesus' life was done in the 70s. It's called Jesus of Nazareth. It, it, there is a... a, a um, a Shakespearean British actor who portrays Jesus. And I call him the robot Jesus because I guarantee if you watch it, Jesus of Nazareth, this guy does not blink the whole movie. Jesus never blinked in that movie. It's fascinating. I don't know how he keeps his eyes open that long. But he doesn't show emotion. The whole movie, there's not one moment of emotion from this actor. And so for me, I, I grew up thinking that my portrait of Jesus for a long time, not because of this movie, just because of the way we presented him, was this calm, Mr. Rogers-like person who never gets rattled, who never gets affected, who never has emotions. Despite the fact that this text says Jesus wept, I have encountered people who think that Jesus never had emotions. Jesus knows what it's like to hurt, to grieve, to be in pain. And this, this miracle and the events surrounding it, no matter what it means for Jesus to have wept here, it shows us that he knows what it's like to be us, to experience those raw emotions, to deal with them. And the other, thing, the other significant thing about this particular story is that this miracle provided the greatest evidence of Jesus' Messiahship. Jesus performed three resurrections during his life. Prior to his, his crucifixion, he brought three people back from the dead. One of those was the widow of Nain's son in Luke chapter 7. The other was Jairus' daughter, um, Mark chapter 5, and also in Matthew and Luke's accounts. And we talked some about these, but Lazarus is the third resurrection. What's significant about Lazarus' resurrection? Jairus' daughter's resurrection was only seen by five other people. Three, three apostles, Peter, James, and John, that he brought into the room, and the girl's parents. And Jesus had declared before he went into that room to all the people outside that she's just asleep. And so for a lot of people, she died that day. She, she had only been dead that day. So for a lot of people, they probably didn't believe it was a resurrection. They thought it was him bringing her back awake. And there weren't that many witnesses to talk about it. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe Jesus told her parents to not talk about it. The widow of Nain's son was actually a funeral procession. So it was out in the open, but we don't know how many people were present. There would have been some, but being that this is a widow and this is her only son, 
We don't have a very big family involved. So it may have been just a handful of people plus Jesus' disciples. Lazarus' resurrection is different. We're specifically told that there are many present, that they are on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Nain was in Galilee, and Jairus' daughter was in Galilee. This is a suburb of Jerusalem within two miles of the temple, and there are many people present. Words going to spread when Jesus brings Lazarus from the dead. Not only that, it's four days. There is no challenging this resurrection. And if you look, I know our time is up, but if you look at John chapter 11, look at the part we didn't read. Immediately after the story at verse 45, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. And verse 46, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do for this man performs many signs? And if you skip down to verse 53, So from that day on they made plans to put him to death. This miracle proved that Jesus was the Messiah to a great many people and became a threat to the religious establishment in Jerusalem to the point that they had to make a plot against his life from that point forward. This is a turning point because from here we start entering the final days of Jesus' life. And that's where we'll pick up next week as we start looking more into the plot against his life and the contributors and the elements that led to it. Let me close out with a brief word of prayer. God, we thank you for another night of study and we thank you particularly for your son's life uh, and for his mercy and compassion. We thank you that he is our sympathizing high priest who knows what it's like to be us. And Lord, we thank you above all for his willingness to surrender to your will. And Lord, we pray that as we leave here, that we will represent him to the best of our ability, that we will shine as lights in this world, that we will serve our community, that we will love you and love others. Lord, we humbly ask for your blessings on us. And it is through the name of your son, Jesus, we pray.